ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Real Estate Investor MBA. My name is Tejas Gosai, and I've had the honor of helping hundreds of investors achieve the American dream by creating generational wealth through real estate. I've spent the past few years interviewing the most knowledgeable experts I could find in the business to cut your learning time and conquer the hardest subjects in the game. Check out rei.mba, which my team and I have packed with over 75 interviews and free access to our real estate roadmap, webinars, and publications. If you're listening, I am rooting for you, and you're already on your way to financial freedom. Cheers, and happy hunting. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to your favorite real estate podcast. It's Real Estate Investor MBA. I have the pleasure of being your host. My name is Tejas Gosai. Please check out our website, rei.mba. We all like to start with a big thank you. Thank you to everyone who's made our show possible. All of our buddies, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio. We're on YouTube. I'm really active on LinkedIn if you want to get a hold of me. We got an awesome show today. I'm going to go through some news before we have our guest on, but we're interviewing Jake Wiley today. He has an amazing podcast called The Limited Partner Podcast, and his whole goal is to create financial freedom without headaches in real estate ownership. A big part of real estate is having the right network to be able to find assets and to be able to deploy capital the right way. Even if you don't have a lot of money, you can create the right path to be able to own real estate one day. And when you do own real estate, there's a lot of leveraging and scalability. So Jake shares how over a 16 year period, he finally figured out the best way to own real estate and it's through this limited partner vehicle. So real quick, limited partner is easily defined by the opposite side, it's a general partner. The general partner in a real estate acquisition is the guy or gal who is taking all of the risk for all the reward, right? They're the ones who are signing their life away for the bank as a personal guarantor for the property. Those are the general partners. When you have limited partners in a real estate acquisition, those limited partners are giving you capital so that they make more money back. They don't want the headaches. They don't want to talk about leaky faucets and things like that. So it's a very great, almost more conventional way to become a part of a real estate asset or just real estate ownership in general. You could own a part of 50 different properties. I manage a private equity fund, and that's actually the principle of what we do. We pool capital for accredited investors and we put it into real estate, cash flowing real estate, right, to create a great return. So listen to Jake, listen to his podcast. It's fantastic. Before I get into the interview, let me share some developments on our website. I work my butt off to try to make sure this program's awesome. Jeremy and I picked the best guests and that's what we're here for, right? My passion is to create generational wealth through real estate investing. And we've done it successfully. All these guests we have here, we have over 70 interviews, just top topics with top guests. And we really deep dive into them. So here's this new section we created called Market Intelligence. My team and I are curating these articles. We think that they're the best in uh, multifamily commercial real estate to read about. So check this out. Commercial and multifamily borrowing up 19%. I'll just read a little clip here. Borrowing and lending backed by commercial real estate set another quarterly record from April 1st through June, although the pace of increase slowed from the first quarter. So in the quarter to quarter comparison, depository loans grew by 42%, investor driven lending by 20%, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were 18% larger and life insurance backed lending edged up by 2%. What does that mean? People are still buying real estate. People are still investing in real estate. Those of you that just caught your wings over the past couple of years and then the market turned like this, that's okay. There are people who make it through these trying times. You know, there's people who are continuing to borrow, continuing to create spreads with the inventory that they're buying. We just had a couple interviews with self-storage gurus like Scott Lewis. You know, there's people that are so niche in what they're doing that they're still able to be very profitable in a down economy or an economy like what we're going through right now with, with inflation and interest rate increases. So 
check out our website, rei.mba. Ah, there was one more thing I was going to show you, but it's called the Real Estate Roadmap. We've put together different sets of our podcast that explain certain topics. For example, asset management. We have five or six amazing experts that talk about just asset management. We have a specific podcast on fundraising on syndicating a real estate deal and the documentation required for that, how to do it legally and clean. We have a bunch of accountants in certain categories of our podcast. So you can sign up for free. It's called The Real Estate Roadmap. And I hope you check it out. Hope you love the interview. We love you. Cheers. All right, guys, we're super blessed. We have Jake here with us. Super busy in the real estate world, in the podcast world. You have a great reputation. Mr. Wiley, thank you for being here. Man, it is great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure. So. If I've never met you and I don't know your content, I don't know who Jake is, tell me about what you've been doing and please brag. Some of those folks are first-time listeners. Yeah, well, I I think maybe it's more of like sharing some of the pain that I've experienced along the way to get me to a place where I I feel like we're we're finding some synergies and some harmony. I'm a CPA. I got out of school a million years ago, went into public accounting. And what's interesting about when you work for, and it's a big four public accounting firm, really interesting when you go there is that there's all these restrictions on what you can invest in, right? Because obviously you don't ever want to have an investment in something that you're auditing. And it's just this really complicated commerce and process of of getting clear. So I gravitated to real estate, right? Because nobody could tell me that we're going to have a conflict on real estate. And believe it or not, there could be with loans and like who you've got a lender and whether or not we audit them. But like, for the most part, yeah, with 99.9% certainty, I was able to invest in real estate no issue. And I found that I loved it, right? I read, you know, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. I'm sure you've probably never heard that on this yeah. podcast. Before. No one ever says that, right? Yeah. No, nobody's ever said that. It's, it's great that everyone it, starts with it though. Yeah, it, it, it is. And I mean, I, I actually, I love it. Like on my show, the Limited Partner Podcast, we talk about it a lot because what's interesting about that book, and this is a little bit of a digression here, but what's interesting Please. about that book is that it gets people to do something, mm-hmm. right? Most books you read and you're like, oh, great information. And you're just like, on to the next one, on to the next one. For some reason, that book and the stories and the way it like outlines it, people get off their butts and they go and actually do something. So I've probably say like 80% of the people that I've interviewed are totally on board with that book. And that was like the catalyst for them actually getting out and doing something. Yeah. So plug, I think that's great. Plug for everybody, please read the book. <laughs> Yeah. Read, read the book. And so I did, right? I read it and I got into real estate and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and buy real estate. So I started buying real estate, brand new, right out of school. I'm a CPA. I'm, I think I know everything and really getting into rental real estate. And I'm like, this is it. This is how you build this mountain of passive cash flow. And it was 2006, seven when I started investing in real estate. So if you guys are familiar with the time frame, like 2008 was when the market just started to completely implode. Right. And that is where we started buying. And I was actually pretty excited. I was like, you know, there's a, there's an old Warren Buffett saying, it's like when there's blood in the streets, you go, you go buy, right? Because everybody else is running away. So I was like, buying, I'm buying, I'm buying. And, you know, then the, the government came around and said, oh, we screwed up all these loans. Like you can only have so many, you know, government backed loans. I think it was four at the time. I think we had six properties and I was like, uh-oh, like my financing source just dried up overnight. So I had to learn how to raise capital to keep myself afloat really quickly. And that was a fun and interesting learning experience. Yeah, um, by the fire, just just running by at the, it. By the fire. I, I don't recommend doing it any other way. Like <laughs> yeah. you kind of just have to be back up against the wall to do it. But long story short, let's, let's fast forward here. The issue that I have with buying rental real estate is that the passive income aspect of it is a myth, right? When you buy and you manage and you've got singles and doubles, like, I am, I can now hang sheetrock. I can rewire electrical outlets. I've unclogged toilets. I've changed toilets. I've been on the roof and pouring down rain, trying to like yeah. put this like roof glue up there to keep the, the roof from leaking. I've yeah. been blowing real insulation. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, real stuff. And it's like, you know, one day you just kind of come to this realization that like, wait a minute, I have like, I'm, I'm a CPA. I've got great income and I'm doing and like, I'm doing $10 an hour work and yeah. it's awful. And then you have one issue with real estate and all of a sudden, like all of that cash flow that you thought you had is gone, right? So like, let's just say you're making a couple hundred bucks a month on your, your, your rental properties and then an air conditioner, like they, they go out, right? Like it happens. A roof needs to be repaired. It needs to be painted. Water heater. Water heater. Yeah. Like a plumbing line is, it breaks, right? And all of a sudden you got to fix it. And like, 
And then you're coming out of pocket, right? And there's moments in time where like, man, I felt like I was just sprouting gray hairs left and right because it's like when it rains, it pours. And, mm -hmm. you know, things never go wrong, like at right. the perfect time either, right? It's Saturday night is when the air conditioner goes out, right? So yeah, when you're with your kids. Yeah. yeah. Or like the moment you leave for vacation, as soon as you get, you know, far enough yeah. away where you're like, I'm far enough, like, boom, you get a call. Yeah. And then Flooding. Last minute, yeah. Like property managers, like, yeah, everybody would be like, oh, you got to have a good property manager. Like a property manager just turns around, takes the call, mm -hmm. considering that they, they answer it, especially if it's on the weekend. And then they just call you and say, hey, we got this problem. What do you want to do about it? Right. So like the, the buck ends up with you. So I think for me, like the big lesson that I've learned, and it took 16 years to figure this out and like rich dad, poor dad, you know, didn't necessarily set me up for this, is that there's got to be a better way to actually get to passive investing, right? Because when you, when you work your butt off, like at a day job and, you know, you, something that you're really good at that pays the bills. And then you're trying to build this like mountain of, of passive income to like basically supplant your income one day. Yeah. You're diluting on both sides. Like you can't be great at either when you're trying to do both. And like, that was the lesson that I've learned. And, and it took me a while. And, you know, I've been, I've, I've gotten to sit across the table from amazing people that are doing yeah. this. And I'm like, man, I know that guy's not out there like scrambling to, to change a toilet or, or standing on a roof in the pouring down, right? He's not doing that, right? He's just investing. Like, how have I, you know, like, I, I knew the answer and it just took me a while. to. Yeah, find yeah, it. yeah. No, I, I, what you're saying is, you know, what I think most, I guess, folks that kind of made it over the, what's the word, to threshold to, yep. to the other side, you know, they've, they've dealt with a bunch of this stuff. They're like, they kind of get sick of it. P the passive investing world is like this mythical <laughs> Yeah. place that's very reachable. Yeah. Didn't mean to digress, but continue. Well, that's, I mean, that, that's really the story, right? So fast forward to today, like there are a lot of people like me that I know are like looking down this path of like, well, I can either buy real estate, own it and kind of manage it, which is what everybody thinks of is like real passive income, or you go invest in like a REIT in the stock market, which everybody has access to. And like, it follows the stock market. It's crazy, right? Like, and if, if, if you guys are looking at your 401ks, right, if, you, if you're employed out there and you're looking at it, like it's a, it's a pretty bleak picture, right? Right. And you have no control. No control. So at least with real estate, you're like, I can manage this property, rents are up, that's great. But like you, you'll reach capacity very, very quickly. And I hope for most of you, one, if, if you're listening to this and you know, you're listening to the, this podcast, like maybe don't make those mistakes because you learned from folks like us that have been there. But two, like you'll reach your capacity really quick. And I hope you reach it faster than I did. It took me 16 years to really just fully have my mind yeah, get to a place. Where, okay, we, we can do this. You still look <laughs> super young, by the way. I don't know how old you are. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll take that. I'll take that. I don't <laughs> get that much. Sorry, I threw you off track. No, no, um, that's great. Yeah, yeah, but look, you've been super successful with helping people as well. You know, your podcast touches a lot of folks. You've talked with a lot of folks. So let's talk about the, the name, Lim Limited Partner. Why? Why limited partner? How does that fit into the mold? You know, get down to the detail on why that's helping people achieve yeah, their dream. Know, yeah, when you when you think about, and you know this, you've got your own podcast, but you know, some of the first advice you'll get is get very niche, right? Like niche down and then get it to a point where you think that's pretty niche and then try and take it another level. And, you know, for me, the lesson learned was I want to be a passive investor. That's what I want. And I think the way through that is, is through call what's a, is really a general partnership, but like you want to be the limited partner, right? So the limited partner is basically just cash, right? Like you put cash into an investment. A lot of times it's a syndication. Sometimes it's a fund that invests in syndications. And I'll, I'll clear up what that means in a second, please. But the idea is that you, you put your money with an operator that knows what they're doing. They're better at it than you, you could ever be. They do it professionally. They love it, lights them up. They have property management, they have scale. And those are the two things that really make a really big difference for an operator is, is having scale and getting those property management fees down and having budgets and everything that in, in includes and operates and anticipates all of these problems that we talked about before that you cannot do with, deal with appropriately like on a single family, right? Because it's binary, right? Like the roof is leaking or it's not, you know, the air conditioner's out or it's not. The tenants are paying the bills or they're not. Whereas you have a hundred units you know, you know, this stuff's going to go bad and your one air can a hundred air conditioners aren't going to go out at once. Right. But you know, every month, like you're going to have repair bills, you're going to have that as part of the plan. And then property management, it's scaled. So like when I was doing the single family, I was paying property managers 10% of the revenue. 
basically they took 10% of the check that came in for basically facilitating taking that check. And then any real problem that came up, they would then call me and say like, hey, we can send our super expensive guy out there to fix it. Right. Or you can do it on your own, right? And those are your options. So there's no scale, but a real property, like when you get into scale, they're, they're charging 3%. So now you, you're picking up 7% and you've got an operator that knows what they're doing, right? So you take yourself out of being like everything. Right? I own the property, I'm responsible for it. And I've got liabilities beyond what I put into it, right? Because if something goes wrong, they're going to sue you know, your company and possibly you, you know, to being what's called a limited partner where your, your liability is actually limited just to the capital that you put in. And it's right. backed by tangible real estate. And then you're basically investing with an operator. You got to find the right people, right? That's part of the, the diligence process to invest with that know what they're doing. So I'll, I'll take a quick step back and try and like maybe clear up some of the issues that people have along the way is that, so the general partner is generally what they would call like a sponsor is the operator. These are the guys that know how to put these deals together, right? They know how to operate them. They've got a team, they've got the property management. Yeah. So you invest with them. The general partner is kind of taking all of that liability, right? If something goes wrong, you have a tenant, you know, trips and falls, there's a lawsuit or whatever, they're coming after the general partnership. You as a and, limited partner? You're, and correct ahead, me, right. they're, they're, no, just, sorry to interrupt, but they're typically, are they typically the guarantor for the bank too? Yes, they, they can be, right? There's, keeping it simple, we'll just say yes, right? Like all of the liability that it's associated with the, the, the deal that's above and beyond just the capital you put in, the general partner, they own that. Where you as a limited partner just says, hey, look, I want an equity stake in this deal. And here's, here's my money. And then if things go sideways, like you're, again, like the reason it's called a limited partner is that like your liabilities cap at your investment, right? right. So like you kind of get the best of both worlds. This is the way I see it is that mm -hmm. you're not taking on adverse risk for you and your, your portfolio. Yes, there is the possibility that you could lose everything, but it's really, really hard to lose everything with real estate because it's right. tangible. Right. Even if the operator just turns out to be a total dud, <laughs> and like everybody walks away from the property, there's still a real estate asset there. There's still something of value that can turn around and be sold and liquidated and you can get some money back. Well, let's just say the worst happens, you're, you're, you're left with nothing. Like that's a heck of a lot better than somebody suing and saying like, we're going to come after that and then we're going to come after your personal assets and we're going to reach through like you're insulated from all that. And then lastly, like when you pick the right operator to work with, they're just, this is what they do. This is how they make their money. This is their livelihood. Their incentives are aligned with yours, right? They want to increase the cash flow because when they increase the cash flow, they really get paid when the deal is done. Yeah. So they increase the cash flow. They bring the rents up. They're incented to run this property as efficiently and as well as they can because like the real kicker on the back end of the deal is, is what makes their lives work, right? So right. you're kind of in alignment, but you don't have to do it. Like nobody's ever going to call you about a tenant problem anymore. Right. Like that's the operator's process. So like the limited partner podcast is, is really kind of like an educational platform to help folks like myself understand like what's even possible. Right. Because this is this is how wealthy invest. Right. Like a billion. Like there's a saying I like to put out there is that, you know, 90 percent of millionaires are made in real estate. Yes. Zero percent of the billionaires. Ever deal with a tenant toilet crash. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so it's That's like, great. You got to reconcile that in your mind. Well, how are they doing it? How are they doing it differently? They're investing as an LP, right? So my objective in life is I want to be the limited part. I don't want to be the guy that's out there taking on all this risk. I don't want to be hustling all of these things. I want to grow my income. And look, the, the reality is that like for the past, you know, decade or so, like the returns, the IRRs on these things have been mid teens to twenties. Right. And then you take these past couple of years and like, we're talking about IRRs in the twenties consistently. And right. again, that's, 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 a, that's a blip, right? These are big numbers. Yeah. Big numbers. And you're doing nothing. So like the lesson for me and the reason I'm sharing this with the world is that it took me 16 years of a lot of blood and sweat and tears. And I wouldn't give it back because I I've learned a lot. Yeah. But the returns I could have gotten investing as a limited partner versus actually doing it myself, they're probably the same. It's, it's really brilliant because everybody, you know, you're, you're, you're nailing it. Everybody thinks they're going to go pick up a hammer. I loved it to, to have people like you on the program because it's, it's like, you know, the whole yellow brick road, like 
you got to know where you're going to go. If you're looking at your first multifamily, if you're if you're a veteran investor, like there's some people who still don't know what 1031s are, which is kind of crazy. But then there's just like you're saying, this niche to be able to go and practice. And you keep using the word risk. And I think responsibility, right? You're kind of pushing responsibility and risk to be able to take the benefit. What kind of clients, I guess, you know, they're high, I'm assuming high net worth individuals and folks that have a different value of time and money. Can you share what type of people you work with? Yeah. So I I think there's a, there's a term, it's an accredited investor, right? It's typically who's investing in that. So to, to define that in a really high, high level, and I'll let you go Google search the actual definition. So, cause I'm not trying to give you perfect advice, but you know, if you're an individual and you've got income over, you know, $200,000 or a net income or a net worth of over a million bucks, or if you're a married couple and you have income over $300,000 and again, the same net worth of a million bucks, you're considered a, right? So like, that's a pretty simple definition. And what I find is that there are a lot of people like me who grew up in an industry have gotten to a point where they've, they've reached this definition of accredited, probably didn't even, don't even know it, mm-hmm. but you know, like the idea of trading, you know, like you could be a really well-paid attorney or a doctor or somebody that, that provides, you know, services on an hourly basis ish. And like, are you really going to trade? Hey, I'm going to billing out at a thousand bucks an hour over here to go do $10 an hour work. And that's, that's what I did. So for, for me, my typical client is somebody like myself that's grown up in the ranks, that has done well in their chosen career. And then they, they, a lot of times people sit across the table, like attorneys are a great example, accountants are a great example, where the guy that's sitting across the table is, you know, like taking off on his private jet to go down to this <laughs> island to vacation because he invested in real estate. And you're like, but wait, you're getting advice from me. But why? Am I sitting on this side of the table, punching the, the, the time clock every six minutes for 12 hours a day? And like, right. you know, you're, you're flying off over there. So like for me, that, the whole world that I'm trying to bring together is to say like, look, there, there's this opportunity to get out there and invest. You don't have to be an expert. You have to be smart about who you invest with. And you've got to know some fundamentals about like markets, operators, you know, different asset classes. It's not overly complex. Like you don't have to be the expert. You just have to find the expert. And then you can take what you've been doing, which maybe you've just been investing in a 401k. Maybe you've got a money manager that's putting your money to work and you're just hoping for the best. But, you know, most likely recently you've been looking at your stock portfolio and 401k and all these things. And you're just, oh my gosh, like, yeah, how to be a better way. And chances are you've started looking at real estate again, 90% of the millionaires out there made their money in real estate. So people like me go jump into real estate, they go buy rental properties and then they burn out. Yeah. Yeah. And they lose it. It's funny you keep saying that because that's in the intro of our program. It's like one of the first, it's like the first sentence and no one actually ever says that, but I I meant on our program, like, right. Anyway, that's cool. Let me get to a point here. You're a CPA. Um, People are scared about the future. I'm, I'm a big proponent of real estate ownership all day. Get rid of your stocks, that type of stuff. Uh, don't don't diversify into that world. What do you see going on for the future? You know, interest rates are kind of crazy. How does that affect the limited world, or or does it even affect you, or is it beneficial for for you? If you could tell us a little bit of crystal ball stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll rub the crystal ball a little bit, and then again, like I, I encourage everybody to go do their own diligence and talk to your own advisors. So that's my caveat. But the reality is, is what's interesting in an in an inflationary period, especially a high inflationary period is that debt becomes your friend, right? And you may be like, what are you talking about? Like the interest rates are going and like, it's, it's higher. But like when you have, especially if you lock in debt and then rates continue to go up, inflation continues to go up. Inflation's actually eating away at your debt, right? Without even having to do anything. It's kind of like a double-edged sword where, you know, let's just say I bought a, I'm going to make this super simple a house, you know, and it was hundred thousand dollars and I was able to take a hundred percent loan on it. And I locked in an interest rate at 5%. Well, inflation's at 8%. Mm-hmm. So really, like I'm eating away 3%. It's kind of like a little bit of a bonus every year because the value of my property is going up higher than like just the interest that I'm paying. So like th- there's, there's a win there. So that's one of the beauties of real estate. Most real estate is levered, right? And like there's a reason that banks will let you put a loan on real estate, but they won't let you put a loan on stock, right? right? So you, you, you take that example and let's just make it more realistic. Like you go to the bank and you say, I want to buy a hundred thousand dollar house. They'll say, well, we'll let you buy that for, you, you come to, you come to the table with $20,000 and we'll give you 80, right? So you, you get to lever it. 
So if you had $100,000, now you can go out and buy five houses with that exact same amount of money, right? So that's, that's one of the real big values of real estate. So in, an, in a high inflationary period, especially if inflation is exceeding the interest rates, even in a climbing interest rate environment, you're getting this kind of net pickup, right? And then if the market changes, you can always refinance, right? But like, it's kind of like if things keep going up and you lock in early, you're actually still winning. Right. It's right. like the, the best time to have bought real estate is 20 years ago. And the, the second best time to buy it is right now. So I'm still really bullish on real estate. I think you got to be very careful. So when I talk about debt, the other thing that like you have to factor in is that the debt markets are what's really causing all the, the, the crux of the issue is that the lenders don't know what to do. They don't really understand what's coming. We're in unprecedented times. Like we went through the pandemic. And you guys watch stocks blew up, like everything blew up, inflation's through the roof, like everything seems like it's booming and it's not super congruent with the market. So now they're, they're trying to like curb this with, you know, the feds raising rates. Like what are, what are we doing? The debt markets don't know. So right. what they're doing is they're, they're, they're adding all of these costs They're making it much harder to get loans. So instead of an 80% loan or really like typically in the, the real estate, commercial real estate, you get 65%. Right. You know, that or 75%, that number's coming down to like 65%. And they're making you buy interest rate caps to basically say that like this thing won't float through the roof, right? Like you're not going to get a loan now at 5% and then like find out six months from now it's at 10%. Right. You buy these caps, but these caps are extremely expensive. Right. Costly. Because they're, they're, yeah, they're trying to de-risk all of this real estate. So those are the things you got to watch out for. So if you're talking, if you're like, hey, I, I love what you're saying and I want to get into this. And you start talking to a potential sponsor, an operator of a deal, like I would ask them, just start, start peppering them with questions about like, how are you dealing with debt? Like what, right. what percentage loan to value are you getting? You know, like what are the rates? Have you bought or are you looking at rate caps? Or are you just letting it float? And if they're like, oh, you know, like we got a decent rate. They don't mention anything about buying the rate cap. Like there's, there's some risk. Totally. So I think hopefully to kind of wrap up your, yeah. you know, sum up the question is that like, I'm still bullish on it. The fundamentals of rents have been increasing. You know, again, there's always that underlying tangible asset. We're in a high inflationary period. We don't anticipate that it's going to go the other way. So again, as long as you, you've got, you know, you, you're finding markets, we've got in migration, which means that there's going to be continued pressure on building. And then you've, are really rents. And then other areas that you think about is like, can they build, right? Is it even possible to build competing, you know, or competing assets in that marketplace? And when you find places that have in migration, it, the, the, the barrier to entry for like new build is hard. Like you're going to be really hard pressed to find a better investment than that and feel really confident that it's going to be a good, a, still a good investment. I love what you're doing. I got to end with something good. I hate it that we got to call time, but real estate helps a lot of people, right? One thing about multifamily is you're housing hundreds and thousands of people in, and, and hopefully you're a good owner, right? The, the folks that you're working with, they're, you know, no one wants to be a slumlord in this business. Mm -hmm. People want to take care of their tenants. And that's really what's happening. And a couple of things that you keep saying, risk, responsibility, reward. It's amazing. How does somebody get to talk to you or join your movement or get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate, appreciate this opportunity. So the limitedpartner.com is the website. There's a podcast. If you want to get to know me a little bit better, hear, hear a little bit more, we've got some shows out there. Check me out on the website. You can email me. It's right there. So it's Jake at thelimitedpartner.com if you want to email me directly. But I'd love to keep the conversation going. I love the feedback, right? It helps the show of like, sure. what are you interested in? What, what are I your mean, concerns? If you're thinking about diving into it, what, what's holding you back, right? And then hopefully we can start answering some of those questions on the show. Love it, love it. It's all in the show notes too. So definitely click around, take a look. Jake, you're the man. Great success and I wish you the best. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Same thing here, real estate investor MBA. We endorse Jake. Check out his stuff. Cheers, guys. Yeah.